Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy Turner. I am the Director of Health Promotion and Senior Health. And on behalf of Virginia Hospital Center, I want to welcome you to tonight's webinar on menopause, the next chapter. I just want to let you all know we are recording this and sometime early next week, we will email all of you a copy of the recording so you can watch it again or you can pass it on to anyone else who you maybe uh, think may be interested in the topic. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the question box. We're going to address as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. We'll try to get to as many as um, possible. Um, so if we can't get to all of them, um, we apologize. So I am now going to hand it over to Leanne. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Leanne Boone. I'm the Director of Operations for our Women's Health Division at VHC Health. Um, I'm excited tonight to introduce you to our two presenters, Dr. Terry Remy and Dr. Amanda Rohn. Um, Dr. Remy is a primary care internist. She's board certified in internal medicine with over 30 years of experience as a primary care internist. She is a member of the uh, Menopause Society and is certified and has been a certified practitioner since 2011. She's a lead provider for three of our primary care practice sites for VHC Health, and she has a master's degree in nutrition and previously a registered, dietitian, a registered dietitian. Dr. Rohn is a full spectrum OBGYN specialist. She has over 10 years of experience. She's board certified in OBGYN since 2014. She is also a certified menopause practitioner since 2023. She's the medical director for our VHC Health OBGYN practices and also the department chair for VHC Health Obstetrics and Gynecology. Previously, she was a computer engineer. So I'm going to hand it on over to Dr. Remy and Dr. Roan and, and hope you all enjoy your evening. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I'm really excited about the opportunity to share with so many people about um, menopause and just what we know about it and what we can help you all understand. Um, so first, a few definitions. Menopause is the permanent end of ovulation in the menstrual cycle, and that we can confirm that this has happened once you've gone 12 months with no menstrual bleeding. Perimenopause is the period leading up to menopause. Um, some people also call it the climacteric, so that includes that time leading up to menopause and that 12 months after the final period. Um, the menopause transition is just that whole period of changes that um, ends with the final period, and then postmenopause is the years after the final me menstrual period. Um, every day, about 6,000 women in the U.S. will enter menopause. Um, surveys of perimenopausal women suggest that overall there's actually a positive attitude about menopause, although definitely some mixed um, thoughts and experiences. And thinking about it, about one third of a woman's lifespan will be spent postmenopausal. The average age of menopause in the U.S. is about 51 or 52. Leading up to menopause, we see changes in the menstrual cycle. Um, so the cycle length becomes variable. Commonly, first we'll see a change from month to month of a week or more, so it's much less predictable. We can also see a change in the bleeding pattern. Sometimes the bleeding is heavier or lighter. We can also see some irregular bleeding. Then we start skipping periods. When you skip, you may have a period of heavier bleeding after that. Um, and basically, we usually will say anytime you have an increase in bleeding, whether it's significantly heavier bleeding, your bleeding is more prolonged, or you're bleeding more frequently than you should be, that's something that you want to bring up with your healthcare provider because that may need to be evaluated by an OBGYN to make sure there's not something wrong. During this time, there's a significant decline in fertility. It is still possible to conceive during menopause, or during perimenopause, I should say, um, but it declines dramatically during that time. Um, so we do recommend that you continue to prevent pregnancy if you don't want to become pregnant until you've gone for 12 months without a period. 
And again, that pers if there's persistent bleeding or spotting, even if it's light, we want you to have medical evaluation because uterine cancer is something that can occur in midlife and we want to evaluate and rule that out. Dr. Um, Dr. Remy, I think your mic might be working again. Yeah, am I back on board here? You Perfect. are. <laughs> All right, awesome. So what brings women to the menopause center? And if I could have the next slide, please. Not their cold refrigerator, that's for sure. Vasal motor symptoms. So that's the term we use to describe hot flashes and night sweats. And about 75% of women as they're going through this perimenopausal phase, it's also sometimes called the menopause transition, will have hot flashes and sweats. Um, when we see patients, they often wonder um, if they need to have blood tests done to help us understand where they are. And the answer is not usually. The estrogen blood levels do not correlate with symptoms. So the diagnosis of menopause is primarily based upon symptoms for most patients. Um, a time when, for example, I might do some blood tests if, is if a patient has had a hysterectomy and I'm just honestly not quite sure what's going on, um, then the blood tests are sometimes really useful. Hot flashes occur because in our brain, we have a thermostat that's called the brain thermoneutral neutral temperature zone that, that modulates our core body temperature. And that temperature zone during the menopause transition and into menopause becomes more narrow. So we don't tolerate as wide a um, spectrum of temperatures that we used to tolerate. The temperature changes in our environment um, will more quickly then initiate flushing of the skin and then sweating to cool us off. Women who have had a lot of premenstrual symptoms um, are more likely to have hot flashes. So phasal motor symptoms may occur any time in the menopause transition, and typically they'll continue into the first two to three postmenopausal years. I think, if I recall, Amanda, and help me out on this, that the average time for postmenopausal basal motor symptoms is about seven years. Um, something so so it's variable, um, and so. I see patients, and I know Dr. Ron does as well, that um, they're still having vasomotor symptoms sometimes for many years after their last period. Um, yeah, that can definitely happen, and they can start well before the periods end, and that's sometimes yeah. under-recognized. I hear from so many women who've had someone tell them, well, that's not menopause because you're still having periods, so you don't need treatment, which is definitely not correct. It does seem that unfortunately the earlier you experience them, they may last longer. Clinically, I'm not sure if there's data on this, but I usually find that if you've gone for a couple of years after your last period and you haven't had them yet, you are probably not going to get them. By the way, we don't see those people. <laughs> you know, they're, they come to us when they're struggling with symptoms, so I'm happy for the ones who maybe aren't going through that, but um, I have a little less experience with women who just cruise right through. Um, some women may have these symptoms for several postmenopausal years, and there's no way to predict how long that might last. Unfortunately, the blood tests are uh, utterly unhelpful in that regard. And the symptoms can be mild, um, and they can be quite severe. So I've, I've seen it all, we've both seen it all, where the frequency can be just a few a day to multiple episodes that are really disruptive um, throughout the day and into the night. So non-prescription management of symptoms. Um, you know, cool environments is kind of obvious. You know, I've heard many people say they're freezing out their families because, because they need the environment cooler, layered clothing so that you can take on and put off. Um, for patients who are breast cancer survivors and some postmenopausal women, mind-body techniques such as cognitive behavioral therapy and clinical hypnosis can help. And then this goes for pretty much everybody. Um, quit smoking because cigarette smoking has consistently been shown to increase vasomotor symptoms. So there's lots of over-the-counter products. Um, studies have pretty consistently shown that over-the-counter products 
um, the contained following are not likely to reduce vasomotor symptoms, black cohosh, evening primrose, soy-based supplements or vitamins. These products are not studied for safety, efficacy, purity, or drug interactions and are generally not recommended. All right, so hormone therapy, and I'm going to let Amanda take it from here. Dr. Brown will talk with you about the hormone therapy. All right, so we do have hormonal therapy, and we'll also talk later on about medication that's not hormonal. Um, this can be indicated for treatment if you are very troubled by your symptoms and if the individual benefits outweigh the risk. This is basically the same way that we approach any medication. You know, even Tylenol for a headache is the benefit of taking it, you know, outweighing the annoyance of. Um, of having to take a pill. Um, there's also some several non-hormone medications that are off-label and actually now a couple that are FDA approved. Um, next slide, all right. Sometimes I feel like I have control over this, but I'm not sure if I do. Um, so hormone therapy for vasomotor symptoms, and we usually call this um, hormone therapy or menopausal hormone therapy, so HT or MHT. You probably might have heard the term HRT for hormone replacement therapy. As a side note, we typically don't use that term, although you know, certainly understand what people mean when they say it, um, because we kind of now think of it as we're not really replacing something. Menopause for the vast majority of women is a natural process. It is physiologic. There's some good evidence that it actually has evolved, and I'd be happy to talk your ear about that if anybody wants to. Um, but it's a normal process. You're not, it's not abnormal to have low estrogen when you're 70 any more than it is when you're seven. Um, so it's not really a replacement. That said, there's no reason why people have to suffer. We have effective treatments, and just because it's natural doesn't mean it's something that you just have to suffer through. Um, so hormone therapy, um, the estrogen is really what um, treats the symptoms, and um, then for women who have their uterus, which is most of us, um, we combine that with a progestogen, and that's combined therapy. Um, the progestogen is added because estrogen stimulates the lining of the uterus. That's what causes the lining to grow every month before it sheds as your period. And so we, we don't want that to happen as an out of control cell growth that could put you at risk for precancer or cancer. So we need to balance estrogen's effect with progesterone. Um, so um, typically when we are tr starting somebody on hormone therapy, we're gonna start within about 10 years of the last menstrual period and or under the age of 60. And that's because we have evidence that shows that starting it later actually does do some harm. Um, the dose of hormone therapy is a lot less than what we see in birth control pills. Um, some of the formulations are actually very similar to what's in a birth control pill, just less. And some of them are different versions of these types of hormones. Go to the next slide. Um, for women who have had a hysterectomy, meaning you don't have your uterus, then we would typically recommend estrogen alone. That's all you need to manage your symptoms most of the time, and it also helps to prevent osteoporosis. Um, we, in the studies that have been done so far, we don't see an increase in breast cancer risk with estrogen-only therapy. Um, and there's no specific time limit to how long you can take it. It's always a risk-benefit calculation, and I usually, with my patients, will readdress every few years, you know, are you feeling like you have a benefit from this? Do you want to come off and see how you're feeling or not? Um, and depending on their individual risk factors, we can continue it without any specific stopping point. Um, some, some women have been um, recommended to take birth control pills or oral contraceptives. Um, and that is commonly very helpful for perimenopausal women. So somebody who's still having periods and potentially someone who still needs to prevent pregnancy. Um, the benefits are that it can really help with bleeding control. The menopausal formulation 
really often don't help with bleeding control. You can have a lot of irregular bleeding. It's something that we can deal with. Everything's individualized. But if one of your problems is irregular bleeding, the pill is probably going to fix that. Um, we also know that birth control pills reduce your risk of ovarian and uterine cancer, and they do help protect bone density. And of course, they prevent pregnancy if that's a concern for you. And they do help with the vasomotor symptoms and some of these other symptoms. Um, if you don't want to have a period, most women can take the pill continuously so that you don't have to have a period. There's no medical reason why you have to. Um, who's a candidate for birth control pills and when to stop is really individualized. Um, expert opinion in the family planning community is basically you don't need to prevent pregnancy anymore after age 55, even if you haven't stopped your period. Um, so I usually don't continue the birth control pill after that stage. Um, but you know, again, it depends on everybody's individual situation. Do you want to talk a little bit about benefits, Dr. Remy? Sure. So hot flashes and sweats typically improve substantially with estrogen therapy. Um, sometimes women will actually tell me they have resolved. Most women will have a little bit of symptoms, but way more manageable. Um, the symptoms also, or treatment with uh, estrogen will also improve sleep and often mood and including sometimes brain fog. That's a little bit of a mixed picture on that one, but um, most often these symptoms will get better. The hormone therapy might improve vaginal dryness. Um, I would say a significant percentage of women will see some improvement, and um, yet many women will still need some additional low-dose vaginal estrogen to treat the vaginal dryness, and then um, protection of bone density. So to um, clarify on that one, that estrogen does not treat osteoporosis, it prevents osteoporosis. So we want to, if we're gonna use it for bone protection, we wanna start it earlier rather than later. Uh, next slide, please. So breast cancer risk. Um, <clears throat> Breast cancer risk, as Dr. Rowan mentioned, is largely related to the progesterone component of the hormone therapy. And the breast cancer risk associated with hormone therapy is considered to be medically rare. And what a, a rare medical event, the definition of that is one that occurs greater than one or less than 10 per 10,000 persons. Um, there are other factors that increase breast cancer risk, family history, your personal menstrual history, use of alcohol, body weight, and others. These risk factors are likely to be additive, and we always want to take these into consideration when we're doing any prescribing um, to have a, a discussion about what a woman's personal breast cancer risk might be. And occasionally the decision will be made that yes, we, we appreciate that you're having hot flashes and sweats, but um, for you, the risks might actually outweigh the benefits. That's infrequent, but it does happen occasionally. Um, next slide, please. Hormone risks include also um, temporary symptoms such as breast tenderness, Increased moodiness is largely related to the progesterone therapy um, and irregular spotting or bleeding. Blood clots, um, you know, blood clots like in your leg or in your lung, for example, are um, a consideration. And one of the things that we're all struggling with a little bit is that um, initially studies that showed blood clots were done with oral hormone therapy, there's um, compelling but not fully established data to suggest that topical estrogen as a patch or as a topical gel, for example, reduces the risk of blood clots. And for that reason, that's usually the preferred form that we give the estrogen um, to patients. There may be some abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, any bleeding that's concerning you personally um, or that, you know, seems like it's persistent and it should be better by now. And we've reminded you that, you know, within three to six months, that bleeding should have stopped. We need to hear about that. Um, invariably, that will result in a pelvic ultrasound to check the uterus and, um, and then sometimes a referral to gynecology for further evaluation. Um, 
it's pretty rare that those episodes of bleeding turn out to be a cancer, but we don't want to miss a single cancer. So we do want to hear about any bleeding. Um, gallbladder disease can occur um, also as a result of starting hormone therapy. I will say to you, I can't think of a patient I needed to treat for gallbladder disease because of hormone therapy, but it is a potential risk. <laughs> um, so truthfully, you know, we have this discussion because what we want to do is get to a place where our patients can say yes for them, the benefits outweigh the risk or not. Um, and I think that's an important discussion to have, if not annually, at least every couple of years, because it's going to change over time for some patients. Uh, next patient, uh, next slide, please. Bioidenticals. So bioidenticals, um, we hear this question a lot. And you know, to put this in a historical perspective, when the, uh, the initial study came out, the Women's Health Initiative in 2002, what, what came about when women started um, this fear of estrogen because of how this was um, presented to them, that there was a significant increase in breast cancer, there, there was a big market that sprung up um, for so-called bioidenticals, which is a marketing term. It's not a medical term. And um, these are products that contained estrogen, progesterone, and sometimes testosterone. At that time, they were promoted as effective and safe alternatives to the traditionally prescribed hormones. Um, and honestly, there's, there was never any scientific evidence to support these claims that these compounded bioidenticals were any safer. Um, they are not subject to FDA testing um, or safety requirements, and the products are not covered by insurance. We still do see patients come in occasionally who have a compounded cream that they want us to replicate for them or um, that they feel really strongly about staying on. Um, next slide, please. So the, the interesting thing about that is many of the now FDA approved products that are available are covered by insurance and are chemically identical to the hormones that are naturally produced in the human body. So estradiol, which is the estrogen in most of our, our prescriptions and then micronized progesterone. Um, and so those are the preferred products. They are, as I say, FDA approved and generally covered by our insurance. And now for most of them, there are relatively inexpensive generics available that seem to work great. Next slide. Um, Dr. Rowan, I'm going to hand it over to you for non-hormone treatments. Yeah, so there is also evidence supporting non-hormonal treatments because um, this is really an important um, option for some people, you know, if you have breast cancer, you most likely cannot use hormone therapy. Um, maybe you just, maybe you don't like the sound of the risks. Maybe you have had a stroke or you have a high risk of having blood clots. Maybe you tried hormones and they didn't make you feel good. Um, and that can definitely happen too. So we have a number of other medications that can help. Um, the antidepressants, so SSRIs and SNRIs, um, it appears that probably most of them have an effect um, at, uh, at reducing the vasomotor symptoms. Paroxetine, which is Paxil, has a form that's actually specifically FDA approved for vasomotor symptoms. And then we use a lot of the other ones off, -labor and, off label and Effexor is commonly used for that too. Gabapentin is a medication that's often used to treat nerve pain. It's also used for seizures. Um, as a side effect, it can, tends to cause sleepiness. Um, so that might be a one that I would choose when somebody has a lot of sleep problems. Um, oxybutynin is used to treat bladder spasms or overactive bladder. Um, so for somebody who has a lot of urinary symptoms, that could be a good choice. Um, Suvexorant is a sleeping medication. Um, None of those drugs, with the exception of the version of paroxetine, um, is FDA approved, so they're off-label. We do use medications off-label constantly in medicine, and they're and we again we're using these with an evidence base. There's been studies that have shown that these are effective, um, and we know um, from other studies and from their primary uses about the safety profile. Um, next slide. Um, there's another, there's a new oral medication called bezolinotant or Vioza, um, and this is for non-hormonal management of vasomotor symptoms in postmenopausal women. Um, it is only approved for postmenopausal women, so it's not FDA approved for those perimenopausal women who are having symptoms. Um, 
it's a neurokinin 3 receptor antagonist. So this is in that thermal regulatory center, that's your brain's thermostat. This is looking at the neurotransmitters that are, um, that are actually involved. Um, they, and they, are, um, they call them the candy receptors, and apparently they named them that on purpose because the researchers were in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, I just found that out, I thought it was kind of interesting. So this this is an effective medication. It's safe. Almost everybody's a candidate, um, but it is expensive, and we we're not seeing the best insurance coverage yet. Um, but it's definitely something where if that's going to be the best option for you, you know, we can do a prior authorization. We can talk to your insurance company about that. Auditory urinary syndrome of menopause. Um, this is something I, I really like to educate women about. Um, it's, you know, women sometimes experience vaginal dryness. Another term for this is atrophic vaginitis. Next slide. So the tissues of the labia and the vagina are very sensitive to estrogen. And loss of estrogen in the menopause transition and postmenopause um, can cause significant vaginal dryness in women who are susceptible. These symptoms may include itching, um, typically without a vaginal discharge, burning discomfort, discomfort with urination, pain with sexual activity, and skin tears that may um, actually bleed. And this is from the vaginal and vulva um, area. The symptoms frequently occur early in the menopause transition, um, earlier than you might imagine sometimes. And the um, there are medical therapies also that may increase the likelihood of severe vaginal dryness. And we see this quite often in women who are being treated for breast cancer. Oh, next slide, please. So this is a, a slide to illustrate what I'm talking about here. On the left side of the screen, what you're looking at is basically normal anatomy. And um, that's you know a normal, healthy woman. On the right side of the screen is a woman with advanced genital, genital urinary syndrome of menopause. And this is an, a patient of mine who, um, a wonderful woman who agreed to be photographed with permission of uh, not only her, but the hospital. So that I had a, an illustration to show patients because she really wanted to kind of educate other women about what had been happening to her. And so this is a picture that, and um, you can see if you look on the slide that the labia seems to have, the labia minora seems to have fused with the um, labia majora. So it becomes sort of one labia. Um, the skin is very shiny and sort of dry and fragile appearing. The clitoris is the clitoris is retracted under the clitoral hood and has almost completely disappeared. And the opening of the vagina, so if you look down at the bottom of the screen, um, that's where you see the anus. And then right above there, if you look closely, you'll see there's a little, tiny laceration in that screen. Um, and that shows you how fragile the skin was because that laceration occurred just as part of um, touching her to do the exam. Next slide, please. So non-hormonal treatment for genital, genital urinary syndrome and menopause includes vaginal moisturizers. These are over-the-counter, um, Replens, Reverie, Hylogyne, and Silky. Um, they're generally Coconut oil, Vaseline. I've had patients use these and say that. Dr. Remy, we lost you for a minute. Can you go back to the um, the top of the slide? Hmm. I think her, your microphone has stopped working again, Dr. Remy. Um. I'll. I'll, I'll take over for a moment while she um, troubleshoots here. So the vaginal moisturizers, again, these are non-hormonal, over-the-counter. Um, most of those, um, they're intended to be used a few times weekly. So it's like a suppository that's inserted um, and is absorbed. Um, it's really like a moisturizer. Um, for that just bothersome sensation of dryness, you can use an emollient or lubricant um, coconut oil. A lot of 
my patients really like that because you can use it as often as you want. Every single time you go to the bathroom, if you want to put on some coconut oil, that is fine. Um, it's not going to reverse any of those changes, um, but it can help certainly with comfort with just dryness. Vaginal lubricants for use during sexual activity. Um, there's a variety of different ones out there. Um, those are going to again help with the dryness and help with lubrication, but when you have this very delicate, fragile, inelastic tissue, all the lubricant in the world is not going to make intercourse comfortable. Next slide. Dr. Remy, you are back on, I see. All right. No, I still can't hear you. Okay, now try. Nope, it went back off. Nope. So, Dr. Roan, you want to keep going? Um, the most effective treatment for atrophic vaginitis is vaginal estrogen. So, this helps to restore the vaginal pH. It thickens the skin, increases secretions, it restores that elasticity, um, the ability of the of, of the tissue to stretch, and it even can help restore the architecture. So in those cases, as you saw in the photo, where the labia have been almost reabsorbed, um, some of that can recover with the use of vaginal estrogen. Um, this can come in the form of a cream or a small vaginal suppository like a pill. Um, there are some other suppositories out there now that are um, compounded with, or not compounded, but um, they're made with vitamin E. Um, and so there's a variety of different um, approaches out there. Um, the vaginal ring, S-ring, is a time-release version. So it's a little ring, flexible plastic that's inserted and releases estrogen for three months. Vaginal estrogen is extremely, extremely safe. Very, very little to none of it is absorbed systemically. So I always tell people this is like, think about steroids. Like if you're taking steroids, you know, you're doping, you get kicked out of the Olympics, right? Um, there's a lot of health risks with taking steroids. Um, but you wouldn't think twice about buying some hydrocortisone cream and putting it on a little rash you have on your elbow. That's a steroid, but it's only being absorbed locally. So you don't worry about any of those other risks or side effects. It's very safe because it's localized only. And that's the same thing with vaginal estrogen. Um, the FDA in its infinite wisdom has left the black box warning on vaginal estrogen, the same one that they give in estrogen pills that you swallow. Um, I think nobody, I don't know, I mean, I think nobody has a financial incentive to lobby them to get this off. I'm not really sure. Um, but it is not true that, um, that vaginal estrogen increases your risk for blood clots or breast cancer. Um, even some women who have breast cancer can actually use vaginal estrogen, um, and we have increasing data now on the safety. It's not necessarily everyone. It's definitely something that is worth a discussion with the oncologist and whoever's treating you for the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, um, but it's definitely something to consider, especially if you're having symptoms that are really impacting your life. Oh, we still can't hear you. We still can't hear you. Your mic shows up, but then it goes away. Mm -mm. Try now. Nope. Hmm. Um, this is a photo of the Vagifem insert, so that little um, tablet that's inserted vaginally. Um, this is a photo of the S ring. Um, another treatment for genitourinary syndrome of menopause is Osfina, is the brand name. The generic is Ospemaphine. Um, this is actually an oral pill. Um, it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So that's a medication that it's not an estrogen, but it turns on some of the estrogen receptors in your body, but turns off some of the other ones. This is related to the drug tamoxifen, which is also a CIRM. Um, tamoxifen is commonly used um, for breast cancer treatment. Um, so with um, ospemaphine, it 
acts as an estrogen in the vaginal tissues, but it does not in all of the other tissues. Unfortunately, because it's kind of anti-estrogen elsewhere, it can increase hot flashes, um, and it may increase the risk of blood clots because it may have an estrogenic effect there. Um, it's not approved for women with breast cancer. We don't really have head-to-head -head comparisons. Um, I think this is this is an option for somebody who um, who can't use a vaginal product, um, who's allergic to all of them, which is very rare, um, or you know, with something like rheumatoid arthritis, who physically can't apply something. All right. Well, I wish Dr. Remy's <laughs> you try again. No. Working. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why, because I I see your little microphone there. I don't know. Do you think maybe if if you log out and back in or anything like that? I assume you already unplugged and replugged. <laughs> Dr. Remy, try logging out, logging back in, and see if that works. And we'll have uh, we'll have Dr. Rome go on, and then you can come back on if you think that might help. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth a try. Luckily, we hadn't really had a plan for who was going to talk about what. We figured we would just um, <laughs> we would just wing it. So here we go. Um, so, you know, I don't have to get worry about getting pregnant anymore. But who cares? Um, because the light switch has gone off. Um, <laughs> I, I like these these photos. And we can go to the next slide. Um, so sexual function in menopause. Um, both sexes increase, experience a decrease in sexual desire with aging, and the rate of distressing sexual concerns peak in midlife women. Um, about 40% of midlife women will report some sexual concerns, and more than one in 10 will report that this is personally distressing to them. Um, there's a lot of factors that can contribute to decreased sexual function. Um, there's certainly that there can be uh, just an impact of the hormonal changes. Um, the physical appearance changes may affect how you feel about yourself um, and your ability to be comfortable in sexual situations. Um, health concerns may lead to avoidance. You know, if you're worried that you're going to leak during sex, you may not want to. Um, surgical changes, if you've gone through a mastectomy, that can certainly have a big effect on how you approach and how you enjoy sexual activity. Sleep disturbances can make you tired and irritable and you know no one really wants to have sex when they're really exhausted um, and other medications that you may be on for other reasons um, can affect your sexual function as well um, sexual side effects are a relatively common side effect of antidepressants that unfortunately are often overlooked because not everybody feels comfortable bringing that up all right dr remy's back let's see if we can hear her. yeah no, can you hear me now yes <laughs> Yay. Um, I'm going to give you a break then. All right. Um, let's talk about sexual function and menopause. So sexual desire can decline with menopause. And truthfully, I um, swear that I talk with a woman who's late into the menopause transition and entering postmenopause that they feel like their sexual desire is the same. I frequently hear that it's declined um, and it's often, um, it often is distressing. So historically, when we think about a, the sexual response cycle, it was thought that, you know, we start with desire. So this may sound familiar when you were younger, that sexual desire is the beginning, then arousal, you'll reach a plateau of sexual arousal, orgasm, and then resolution. So we now know that for women, um, it's more complex and non-linear, perhaps. So intimacy may or may not lead to sexual activity, may or may not lead to arousal and satisfaction and intimacy. Um, so for many of my patients, um, sexual activity needs to be a bit more of an intentional decision um, with the appreciation that sexual desire and arousal are going to occur during sexual activity, perhaps as opposed to before. Next slide, please. Hormonal changes in menopause and the relationship to sexual function are complex and not completely understood. Um, there may be some um, 
what's described as moderate therapeutic benefit for the use of testosterone therapy in postmenopausal women diagnosed with what's called hypoactive sexual desire disorder. It's another way of saying the, the decrease in libido and interest in sex is sufficiently distressing that you feel the need for treatment. There are no FDA approved testosterone products for women. The testosterone products that we may prescribe are products for men, and then we use them in much smaller doses off label for women. Next slide. Oh, help. <laughs> I'm losing my waist. Weight gain and menopause. Um, I would say I hear this. Hmm? I don't know, Dr. Rowan, it might be 100% of the women we see, but darn close. Um, yeah. And yeah. yeah, average weight gain in the menopause transition. Now, I'm giving you data. This is data, okay? Average weight gain in the menopause transition is five pounds. Many women report more than a five pound weight gain. There's no scientific evidence, and I have women who would take me to the mat over this, but there's there's no scientific, scientific evidence that menopause itself nor hormone replacement are the direct cause of weight gain. Weight gain is likely multifactorial. We all get a more sedentary lifestyle typically as we reach our middle years, age-related decreases in metabolism, and to put that in perspective, by the way. So for every decade after the age of 20, our metabolism naturally declines by about 3%. So by the time you're at about age 50 to 55, there's been about a 10% decline in your basal metabolism. Um, and I will say this, um, since most people don't know it, but even for those of us who do, have we intentionally cut back our calories by about 10%? No, <laughs> probably not. The slower weight loss that occurs after menopause is probably a symptom related to menopause. So those calories that used to be fairly negotiable, you know, holidays and vacations and birthday parties are much less negotiable than they used to be, um, harder to lose. And um, there is less loss of central and visceral fat. This is the fat around the waist and the internal organs um, as you're attempting to lose weight. Next slide. Hormone therapy does not result in weight loss. Um, I, you know, I wish I could say it was true, but it does not. Um, increasing exercise as you're able to do so, limiting calories remain uh, the best approach to prevention of preventing further weight gain. Medication to treat obesity when your BMI is greater than 30 may be indicated for some persons. Um, next slide, please. Skin changes in menopause. Get a lot of questions about skin changes because um, you know it would be great if we could say yes, hormone therapy will keep your skin younger appearing. It does not. Um, it does support skin collagen and skin thickness. About 30% of skin collagen is lost in the first five years after menopause, and then about 2% per year after the first five years. These statistics, interestingly, are similar to the rate of bone loss in menopause. Um, most of these skin changes we see are from photo aging, not from menopause. And prevention of skin changes is not a reason to use hormone replacement. Next slide. This lovely woman, um, it, estrogen will not reverse what we see here. This is photo aging and also a loss of elastin in the skin with aging process. Next slide. Hair loss and hair growth. This I was not expecting. So female pattern hair loss. The, the picture on the right is a typical female pattern hair loss. You'll see that the part has widened. There's hair loss typically right at the forehead and then trending backwards toward the top of the scalp. And I put the picture of the Mona Lisa here because when I learned about female pattern hair loss, I thought that looks so familiar. And Honestly, our Mona Lisa clearly has female pattern hair loss. And now the next time you see Mona Lisa, you will never forget that. <laughs> next slide, please. So hair changes in menopause. Um, some women do experience changes in their hair. 
female pattern of hair loss is largely a result of genetic predisposition. So if you reach back into your family gene pool, you may remember your mom or your grandmother or even family members on the father's side of your family um, have all had hair loss. And it seems to be mostly related to an alteration in the ratio of estrogen to testosterone and possibly environmental factors in those persons who are genetically predisposed. About 40% of women will have some identifiable hair loss by the age of 50. Excess hair growth may occur on the upper lip, the chin, and the cheeks. This is also related to testosterone in relationship to estrogen levels. Um, you would probably like to know that those hairs growing on your chin are also sometimes called rogue hairs, which I think is an apt description. Um, Hair loss that occurs over a relatively short period of time is typically from something called a telogen effluvium. So stress, meaning largely um, physical stress, like an illness or a big surgery, even pregnancy, hormonal changes um, can result in a more rapid hair loss. And then there's typically hair regrowth after this type of hair loss. Next slide. I always want patients to see a dermatologist. Occasionally we find there are scalp conditions, typically inflammatory scalp conditions that can be treated by the dermatologist. Hormone therapy does not treat hair loss on the scalp nor prevent facial hair growth. Anti-androgen drugs such as spironolactone, um, which is a, a oral medication, topical minoxidil. Now there's a product, um, a Rogaine product at 2% intended for women. I have never had a single patient tell me it worked. Um, typically they might get better response with the 5% solution intended for men. Low dose minoxidil and finasteride, also um, oral medications and low dose laser therapy. Um, all of these have shown some um, improvement in regard to the hair. Um, next slide, please. Urinary incontinence. Um, Dr. Rohn, I'm gonna let you take it away. Um, so urinary incontinence, unfortunately, is very common. And this is one of these things that I like to say, although it's common, that doesn't mean it's normal. Um, and it doesn't mean that you should have to suffer through it. Um, a lot of women may notice urinary incontinence after giving birth. Um, but I have seen premenopausal women who have never been pregnant who have bothersome incontinence. But it, you know, the pregnancy is a risk factor and getting older is a risk factor. Menopause probably does contribute at least to some forms of urinary incontinence. Um, and it's not clear exactly why, although I think some of it is related to actually the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, where it's really those tissues on the vulva that are helping to support the urethra, if they're not as strong, then you may have um, some leakage there. You know, other factors that can increase is other medical conditions as well. Um, and hysterectomy um, is something that can probably unmask. Um, basically, if the uterus was full of fibroids or something, it's holding everything up. Now, all of a sudden, you don't have your uterus, your bladder is free to sink down, and you're more likely to leak. Um, and this is something where um, it's usually, if you're considering a hysterectomy, your gynecologist um, should at least kind of think about this um, beforehand. Um, incontinence is complicated. There are a number of kinds. Most people will have stress, urge, or mixed, although there's other kinds as well. Stress is basically like you leak when you cough, sneeze, jump. Um, urge is you're running to the bathroom and you can't quite make it there in time. Mixed is you have both. Um, there's also overflow incontinence. There's insensible urinary loss. There's a lot of different ones. Um, Often we can get a good sense of what's happening based on the history, just talking to the patient, um, but we need to do a physical exam. Sometimes there needs to be other testing um, to really zero in on what's the cause. There are a lot of different treatments, um, and I kind of put them in several different buckets. One is behavioral, so things like fluid restriction, like this thing in the U.S. where you need to drink eight glasses of water a day, that's a myth. Like there's no medical evidence for that. And in Europe, they drink way less water than we do and they don't all have kidney problems. You don't need to push fluids all the time unless some people do and your doctor told you that. But um, you know, those like giant jugs that people have that say like keep drinking all day, you don't need that. It's just gonna make you have urinary frequency. Um, so kind of being sensible about your fluids. Um, 
bladder training or timed voiding. This is basically, um, bladder training is, you know, your brain and your bladder are working together. And this is why every day if I walk out of my office at 5 p.m., I suddenly have to pee, even if I jump, just went 15 minutes before, because I've trained myself that I'm going to go before I get in the car on the way home, because what if I have to go, um, you know, and I'm, I'm on the highway. Um, so I cannot walk past that bathroom without having to go. And as soon as I get home, I have to go again because I've trained myself that I go as soon as I get in. That is, you know, that's fine. That works fine with my schedule. It's not a problem. But basically, that's an example of what's happened with my, my brain and bladder connection. And that is actually something that you can undo. So if you're feeling like you have to empty your bladder really frequently, um, again, like see your doctor, make sure that there's not anything physical wrong with this. You know, you don't have a UTI or something, um, but you can say, OK, I'm going like every hour. I'm going to set a timer and I'm going to wait an hour and 10 minutes and I'm going to take some deep breaths. I'm going to do what we call quick flicks, like tightening of the muscles. Um, you know, and then I'm going to go and you can gradually lengthen that time. And it's actually um, you can actually retrain your brain and bladder to to feel full later. Um, so those are some things that you can do on your own. Um, there's also basically. Um, pelvic floor muscle training, and that can be, you know, Kegel exercises. Nobody can remember to do Kegels. It's impossible to know if you're doing them correctly. Um, my favorite cue is imagine that you're picking up a blueberry with your vagina. I'll like give everyone a moment. You can imagine it, um, but a different one might work for a different person. Um, pelvic floor physical therapists are amazing lifesavers, and I love to refer people to pelvic floor PT. They can help you like zero in on those muscles, get um, you know, um, figure out how to use them um, correctly, and also relax correctly because sometimes part of the problem is you're actually too tight. Um, if you don't want to see a pelvic floor PT, there are some devices that you can buy over the counter that have sensors. So it's an inserted device. It has sensors. You do your exercises and it gives you feedback on the screen of like, you know, where are you doing it? Are you doing it correctly? Are you lifting and squeezing versus like bearing down? Um, there are um, injections, bulking agents next to the urethra. Um, there are surgical procedures. Um, and for those kinds of things, we refer you to our urogynecologist, um, who is wonderful. Um, for some women, their incontinence may improve with vaginal estrogen. That's really going to depend on what the cause is. If it's related to that, um, to those atrophic changes, then it may help. But if it's um, like urge incontinence, usually that's not going to. Everybody's different. All right, you can do all the rest of the topics on that list there. <laughs> yeah, well, guess what? Um, this is this is basically the end of our talk because there was just there's so much to talk about and so what we wanted to do is uh, talk about the things that people bring up in our consultations probably most commonly um if you can go back that one slide please yeah so osteoporosis headaches migraine headaches and how they change um menopausal arthritis heart disease is a big one vision and hearing changes insomnia and mood changes um, these are all things that we absolutely do discuss during our menopause consultations if those are things that are important to the patient who's coming in um, and um, may tailor some of our treatments to address some of these issues um, next slide please so in summary, there are so many changes that occur during and following the menopause transition that affect your health, lifestyle, and relationships. This is a time for evaluation and optimization of health to prevent health problems when possible. Um, the symptoms of menopause are manageable, and you can absolutely feel better as you go through this stage of your life. Next slide. So um, our providers, and right now it's um, Dr. Verona and myself, and um, we will be having others join, but everyone who joins the Menopause Center is a Menopause Society certified practitioner. Um, this is uh, someone who is a licensed healthcare provider. And so um, it does not, by the way, have to be a physician. We have nurse practitioners who do this as well. Um, and you have passed a competency exam 
um, that allows the Menopause Society to certify you, and that exam is valid for three years. So every three years, we have to recertify. Um, Everyone is required to maintain credentials by submitting to the Menopause Society evidence that we're doing continuing education um, related to menopause every three years. We, we have to provide evidence of that. Um, we provide consultation for women who are currently having menopause concerns or questions. And so it isn't just women who are very symptomatic that we see. We also spend some time with patients who are just, they're just concerned about their health in general and what they might be experiencing going forward and how can they be proactive um, to prevent some of the, of the things that concern them. Um, our goal is to provide evidence-based management of symptoms and discussion of concerns related to menopause, and that's about safety. You know, evidence-based medicine is, we view, probably the safest route to go for providing treatment. Um, we often work in consultation with your healthcare provider, and we have a very strong referral base, um, as we need to use for primary care referrals gynecologic referrals, urologic, breast concerns, public floor therapists, um, and others that are available to support us and to support our patients. We do not provide compounded or injectable hormone therapies. Next slide. I think and we have the next slide. If the, yeah, there we go. Okay, <laughs> that's the end of our talk. That is one of the most beautiful beaches I've ever been on, by the way. <laughs> So we are going to do, um, I know we're at the time, so people have to leave, we understand, but I do want to get to some people's questions because we do have lots of questions. I do remind want to remind people we are going to send um, a copy of the recording that will include the Q&A part um, if you have to log off. So um, just to get to um, some of these questions is the, um, and a, a um, I apologize if my pronunciation is not good. Is the um, Vioza that you talked about similar to Effexor, E-F-F-E-X-O-R? It's totally different. Um, I, I see the names do sound kind of similar, but they're very different. Effexor is, is an antidepressant medication, so it, does, it works on um, serotonin um, in your brain um, and has a number of very important uses. Vioza is specifically working only on those neurotransmitters that are involved in thermoregulation. Um, so it doesn't have any effects on mood or you know, any of these other symptoms either. Okay, great. So um, Dr. Remy, I know that with your background, this is probably one for you. Beyond medication, are there certain diet foods to avoid or include as it comes to menopause um, symptoms? Uh-oh, are we missing her again? working again. Uh-oh. I'll wait for her to start talking, and then meanwhile, I'll switch to another one. Um, I understand that joint pain is a symptom of low estrogen. Um, I wasn't expecting this at um, all. Um, does hormone replacement therapy help with joint pain? Sometimes. Um, joint pain is a pretty common symptom related to menopause. Um, and yeah, you're not crazy. It's not on the, the big list, but it is something that's experienced by a large number of women. Um, Hormone therapy, there is some evidence that it helps with joint pain. Um, it's not really, it, it's not a super impressive effect, but so I wouldn't necessarily take it for joint pain alone, but I do see patients who have an improvement. In the Women's Health Initiative study, it was something like 60% of the placebo patients got, or no, 50% of the placebo patients got an improvement in their joint pain and 60% of the hormone treated patients got an improvement. So like, yes, it helped, but there was a, a large placebo effect. Um, but yeah, there may be a benefit. All right. Um, <clears throat> does estrogen therapy help with cortisol levels? Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I'm gonna say, I, 
don't know the answer to that question. We generally don't measure cortisol levels unless there are signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency, which is quite rare. Um, so I, I don't know that there's a direct correlation, Dr. Rowan. I don't know. Can you chime in on that one? Not that I know of. I mean, I assume that if you're not sleeping well, you're going to have higher cortisol levels. So if we fix that, it might improve. All right, Dr. Remy, you want to go back to that nutrition food question? Sure. Um, so the nutrition question, you know, interestingly, a handful of years ago, the Menopause Society um, advised, you know, maybe some foods might increase symptoms, spicy foods, alcohol. That's sort of fallen by the wayside. There's really no data to support that. So the diet itself does not appear to play any role in menopause symptoms. And what about, you hear a lot of association with like soy and, um, oh, you know, you should be soy foods, um, do help or don't help any, any, or increase your risk for breast cancer. Any thoughts on the soy products? Pharmaceutical products, um, the estrogen that we use is um, largely derived from soy products. And yet to get that kind of effect from a uh, diet, you'd have to eat just enormous quantities of soy products. So so practically speaking, it's it's honestly not of much value. Okay. Um <clears throat> Okay, so this is, and this is good. See, this is why we have webinars so that people can um, get accurate and for, you know, get all sorts of different really good information. Um, I've heard on social media about estrogen for your face that is meant to be a fountain of youth for your skin. Is that true or fake news? <laughs> it's probably not. There's been a fair number of studies about estrogen for your face, um, and uh, they've had decidedly mixed results. Um, one dermatologist who I trust thinks that using a tiny amount of estrogen on your under eye area only, um, that there is some reasonable evidence for benefit for that. We really don't have a, like a lot of data on this. I think that, it, I mean, the amount that you would use here is minuscule. I can't imagine that that could possibly be dangerous. Um, does it help? I don't know. All right. And I think you kind of answered this um, when you talked about skin changes, but I do want to ask it. Um, it talks about the why do some women in, in perimenopause, postmenopause experience brown spotting on their face? Are hormonal changes the cause? Oh, so um, there's a condition called melasma that can occur with hormonal changes. And sometimes we see this during pregnancy. Sometimes it's a side effect of birth control pills. It is not typically a side effect associated with entering menopause. Um, but back to my lady with the elastosis and sort of saggy looking skin, um, sun exposure that we had decades before our middle years, those brown spots are gonna show up in your 50s. Um, and they're, they're called solar keratoses, and they're benign, but um, not necessarily cosmetic. Okay, thank you. Let's see, sorry, I'm scrolling down all these. Um, what do you think about Aberin, I'm not certain if I'm pronouncing that, A-M-B-E-R-E-N-O-T-C for long-term use. Um, I, I've heard of it, but I don't remember what it is. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the product. Okay. Oh, it's, so it's one of these um, like over-the-counter supplements that's supposed to help with um, with menopausal symptoms, um, it's not something that I would spend your money on, to be honest. Um, we just don't have evidence that any of these products are effective. Okay, someone else said, again, oh, you guys are challenging me with these um, pharmacy names. Um, I take 25 milligrams a day of S-P-I-R-O-N-O-L 
a tone. Perfect you guys tone. know what that is for uh, blood pressure. Is this enough dose to help with hair loss due to menopause? Or are those even is What's that? 25? No, it's not. The usual dose for um, treating hair loss is 100 to 200 milligrams. Okay. There we go. All right. I see. I think a lot of these other questions, people have really been really good about questions, but they're. Um, they seem to be similar, so I'm going to go through. Does anyone else um, have any other questions they want to um, type in before they leave? I do want to um, mention um, when you get the PowerPoint, um, the recording, I will also include in the email information on the link to information on our new menopause clinic and also our, um, they mentioned our, our PT group that does the pelvic floor physical therapy. They are excellent. So I will include the information if any of you are interested in um, our pelvic floor program here at VHC, I will include that. And I will do a plug for our health promotion department we have in the fall. One of our yoga instructors just got certified in menopause yoga. And so we will be having two four-week sessions of menopause yoga starting this fall. And I will include the link for that. One more question came in about um, how do I combat migraine headaches before periods? Hmm. So there are, there are a number of different options, um, and I think it's worth talking to both your neurologist um, or your primary care doctor if they are treating your migraines and an OBGYN. Um, some women will get really good benefit with basically menstrual suppression, so taking birth control pills continuously. Um, that's usually my go-to. Of course, I'm an OBGYN, so you know that's like my, my first thing in my toolkit. Um, so, or other, you know, if you can't take birth control pills or you don't do well on them, then some other kinds of um, menstrual suppression. There also um, are some really exciting migraine medicines out there now that can even be taken taken preventatively. I don't know if you have anything to add, Dr. Remy. Yeah, you know, um, something that's important perhaps to understand. So menstrual migraines, and um, <laughs> I'll just share this with you. Like I had them all my life and didn't know, like I didn't get it that it was related to my menstrual cycle, but at least once a month I would have a terrible migraine. It wasn't until I was like in my twenties that I realized, oh, and two days later, I'm gonna start my period, right? So it's the drop in the hormones right before the onset of your period that will trigger a menstrual migraine. And as women are in the menopause transition, their, their ovulatory changes and their hormonal changes become variable and unpredictable. So sometimes in the menopause transition, there's an increase in migraine headaches, um, and just like Dr. Roan mentioned, menstrual suppression. So these are women I will often put on continuous birth control pills because it just takes that whole variability of the hormones out of the equation. And usually the headaches get better or go away. Okay, I'm gonna take two more questions. So here's another, oh, here's another um, pharmacy. Lots of medication questions. So we talked about the Vioza and the one medicine. How about... I'm spelling this one too. Um, e L I N Z A N E T E N T. Do you know that one? I think maybe that maybe that was Fezolinatan, um, except without the first. Fezolinatan, I'm thinking. Yeah. 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 So that's Vioza. Vioza. Yeah. Okay, so those are the same thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then um, yes, yeah, someone's saying. Do you see postmenopausal women too, ladies? Yes, yeah. they do, right? I'll answer for them. Absolutely. <laughs> um, all right, and then one last question. Is there a connection between intensity of hot flashes in menopause and ovarian cysts in perimenopause? Any relationship? I'm not aware of any data on that. 
Um, I wouldn't be surprised to find that they tend to correlate, but honestly, I, I, I would just be speculating on possibilities. It seems plausible, but I don't know. And Dr. Remy's video is frozen, I think. All right. All right. Well, that we've gone a little bit over, but I, we had so many great questions. I wanted to try and get to as many as possible. I want to thank um, both Dr. Remy and Dr. Roan for their time. Um, you know, I, what I love about this is, you know, our, our mothers, um, if you're in menopause, then I can probably say that our mothers and our grandmothers, um, for most of us, this was a topic that no one ever talked about before. Um, and so I just think it's very refreshing that we have menopause clinics, that we have programs on menopause and that we're now talking about it and that women don't have to suffer through some of these symptoms and um, there are things that they can do. So again, everyone, thank you for your time. We will be providing you with um, additional information so that you have access to all the wonderful services that we offer here at VHC Health. So thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much.